Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to my presentation whereby I aim to examine the process of creating theatrical lighting for stadium events and their broadcast on HDTV. I will start with a look at the first stadium event which I was invited to light in Sheffield in 1991. This was the occasion of the World Student Games at the Don Valley Stadium. The brief called for normal stadium lighting for the athletes parade and then a more theatrical ambience for the lighting of the cauldron ceremony and finally near darkness for the finale firework display. I'm afraid this is the only picture I've got from 20 years ago. I tried to get some off a VHS copy of the show but I wouldn't offend you with what they look like. Although the costs for the games overran to such an extent that Sheffield Council are still paying for the cost of the event, I think £22 million a year still, the lighting budget was very small. We hung some trusses full of Molfe floodlights with scrollers under the main canopy, these guys here, so that we could introduce some coloured light from the point of view of the VIP audience and the main cameras. We discovered that if we put one colour in the scroller in four adjacent frames, and roll the scroller continuously back and forward, we could make the colour last for nearly 10 minutes. We still had to light the rest of the stadium with very little budget, and I decided to place colour in front of the four existing stadium lighting towers. So we manufactured standoff frames, which came to a total cost of £2,000, including the rigging, and I had one corner in white, one in yellow, one in amber, and finally one in red. As the evening progressed, we turned off the towers one by one, <coughs> brightest first, until the fireworks finale was lit in just the one tower of red light. A very basic approach to controlling stadium lighting, but certainly cost effective, and the TV director was quite happy with the results. Happier certainly than astronaut Helen Sharman, who became the first person to drop and extinguish the Olympic torch. One of the fantastic aspects of this type of work is our involvement in historic occasions. And there's been no bigger event for me than the Winter Olympic Games in Turin 2006. In December 2002, I received an email from an executive of Filmmaster in Italy asking me whether I would join their team to pitch for the Winter Olympic Games opening and closing ceremonies. The Filmmaster pitch was deemed to be the most complete in terms of organisational and production content by the organising body Toroc, and all we had to do now was realise everything that we'd visualised in our presentation. The lighting design had to encompass the following elements of the event. It had to illuminate a cast of thousands on a massive four stage the size of a football pitch, world-renowned acts on a performance stage larger than most major rock shows, a stadium full of interacting audience, and illuminate the sky above to make the event visible on the Turin landscape. The design had to achieve all this in February in a venue close to the mountains where football matches were often cancelled as the players could not see the ball due to fog. The event also had to be lit to a high definition broadcast standard to be viewed by two billion people worldwide. So firstly I needed to establish exactly on what control system we would program our lighting rig of over 24,000 DMX channels. Fundamental to this achievement was UK programmer Ross Williams, who designed the control system and its distribution around the stadium. With a daylight environment, such a large rig and weather concerns, there was no other choice than to utilise a virtual lighting program system, and long-time personal favourites Cast Lighting of Canada supplied four WYSIWYG perform systems to connect the desks to our virtual CAD PCs. I then spent two weeks modelling the set design and stadium in 3D and to complete the virtual design I had to finalise my choice of lighting equipment from the real world. But first, where to hang the lights? The stadium was being modernised and the building was to include a new roof, but at this stage the engineers would not commit to the eventual weight carrying ability of the structure. Also snow loading was a significant factor in winter in Turin. We needed an independent solution, so I sat down with set designer Mark Fisher to develop a lighting tower placement and design that could be integrated into the set architecture and be as unobtrusive as physically possible, while still providing me with reasonable lighting positions for my equipment. At one end of the stadium we had our performance stage with gold painted truss uprights supporting Mark's impressive roof design for the massive theatrical Sipario curtain 
to be featured with Luciano Pavarotti in the opening ceremony finale. At the opposite end of the field, similar gold truss uprights supported the innovative moving ring structure that would form the Olympic symbol prior to the athletes' parade. And we decided to extend this motif by creating four ground-supported trusses in the four corners of the field. These guys here. At the opposite end, I've done that, sorry. The six ski entrance ramps of the stage design were delineated by exterior LED fixtures, both to light the ramp surfaces and the hundreds of performers who would be upon them. LED battens were placed all around the rear of the stadium as audience backlights and to supply fast and effective chases around the stadium. The velocities that we achieved with some of these effect chases were further testimony to the processing power of the high-end control system. And we created some superb 360 degree effects at speeds that could not have been achieved with moving lights with their mechanical colour and dowsing technologies. I still resist using LED sources on faces, but as can be seen from the latest developments and new products from companies such as iPix and Robert Juliet, the days of LED limitations in terms of low CRI figures for skin tones are soon to be over. Mindful of stadium stories of cancelled football matches due to fog, I was keen to place a significant percentage of the rig as close to the central performance floor stage as possible. We integrated a technical trough into the set design around all the edges of the fore stage and its central mosh pit. The mosh pit was a feature designed both as a platform for the synchronised choreography of legs, arms and light sticks waved through a split elasticated skin and to place the seating of the athletes upon their entrance as close to the Separio performance stage as possible. The arrangement allowed artists to perform in close proximity to an audience and not only to those sat hundreds of feet away in the stadium stands, thus reflecting Mark Fisher's complete understanding of concert environments. Imagine being a performer on that stage and the nearest person is over here. Difficult to do. The technical trough was open to the elements, so a robust light source with a very wide angle lens was needed for this footlight position. We needed a moving light that should individual sources from this low angle flare into the lenses of certain cameras, the simple expedient of panning them slowly across the performers would alleviate this problem. Our theatrical aspirations for the show, and its creation for HDTV as well as our live audience, decreed a very specific approach to the lighting of the hundreds of performers who were to appear in the show's artistic segments. Historically, these events have been lit with a multitude of lighting sources from every available position around the stadium, thus producing a very even lighting coverage but not providing defined key lighting for TV. What I wanted to achieve was effective key lighting and coloured shadow to define the features of large groups of performers. Hence the placement of the four towers at 90 degrees to the centre stage point, just as we would in the more intimate environment of a theatre in the round. Italian searchlight company Space Cannon was the main lighting contractor and I asked them to develop a four kilowatt unit with dichroic colours and an even coverage of around 10 to 30 degrees to provide stadium-sized key lights. The only other system that came close was from Synchrolite, and though this was my preferred option, as they actually existed, engineer Bruno Bayardi, now sadly deceased, but then the driving force and brain behind the company, convinced me that they could come up with the goods. After reviewing the developing prototypes, we took eight units out to Doha to try them out on the opening of the Aspire Sports Centre, as we did not want to try out new products on the Olympic Games. <coughs> Unfortunately, the units suffered from heat problems and never worked properly at all. I was asked to find the name for the new product, and I proposed Stella. Space Cannon understood this to have been derived from the Italian word for starlight, but the inspiration came from the fact to me that they looked like beer kegs. We were fast approaching the games by now, and at the 11th hour, Space Cannon produced an effective 4 kilowatt wash light, and we authorised their inclusion on the lighting system. Some, of the 100, some 140 of the new Stellars were rigged, and when we came to focus, I realised that we had a big problem. They were less bright than the 1200 watt Roby and Martin fixtures next to them. I called Bruno and the executive producer out onto the pitch, and we made the awkward decision to de-rig them, 
and replace them with the most powerful sources available at short notice from Martin, Roby and Comar. Now that space cannons sadly no longer exist, I can talk about the reasons for this. Apparently the gas mitts had been wrong in the new lamps and it was not their fault, but it was still a very difficult position to be placed in to send the entire new system back to the truck. The Sapario stage also had 144 paths mounted on sign booms for general stage illumination and cross-lighting of the many aerial performers featured during the events, including the beautiful Dove of Peace formation on the climbing net. The lighting, design amongst, the lighting designers amongst you will appreciate the challenge of evenly side-lighting the performance on this 60 metre wide climbing net. The stadium audience already had their LED backlights, and as they would be wearing white, actually grey TV smocks, we needed to illuminate them for background shots and for close-ups during applause and crowd interactions. One of the ways that HDTV impacts on our work as lighting designers is the clarity of the background. With standard definition cameras, shots of crowds around the performers could be treated as no more than animated colour blocks, the wallpaper, if you like, of the picture composition. However, the viewing audience can now make out the detail of the background much more clearly. And as the human eye is drawn to faces, it is our responsibility to light them in a more flattering manner than previously required. 